so again welcome and thanks for coming those of you that, that are returning suckers for punishment those who are here coming for the first time um so thank you this is the sixth of eight on where we've looked at the history of christmas it's based upon a book coming out presumably later this year uh which at least i've called unless the publisher has a better idea uh the good uh the bad and the beautiful uh history of christendom in three dimensions so there are three dimensions the good the bad and the beautiful time here um uh so each chapter has a section of the good mostly the saints but not solely other good things happen that are not necessarily done by saints the bad um so the city of god the good city of man the bad and the beautiful so great works of art music literature um the visual arts architecture etc in each century so one chapter for each century and that's what we've been doing going through the centuries and we've now reached the 17th and 18th centuries and the, the title i've given to this is the title of one of those two two chapters in the book religion and superstition so um you know, certain certain nations come to the fore come to prominence in certain centuries and the 17th century was very much the, the french century france was very much at the center of things both what was good and what was bad but we'll begin with what was good and with the with the great saints because most of the greatest saints of the 17th century came from france and the first uh, the springs to mind is st francis de sales um that certainly as regards um his enduring legacy across the centuries it's his writing an introduction to devout life particularly um perhaps uh he's also made a doctor of the church and he's the patron saint of writers uh the same century as saint vincent de paul uh and saint louis de, de mariac um that they co-founders of the sisters of charity which was the first non-cloistered uh female religious order um and obviously saint vincent de paul societies they have today so we know about the work that they do and also the, the century of the reformed uh, Cistercians, uh, the, now known as the Trappists. Um, and uh, again, like the previous century, the, the, the 16th century with the uh, reform of the Carmelite movement under St. Teresa of Avila um, and um, uh, St. John of the Cross, uh, the Trappist was a, a, about revitalizing um, uh, uh, an old order of the church through reform but the reform is not uh modernizing or liberalizing but on the contrary it's actually getting back to a strict observance so uh these became known as the cistercians of the strict observance it's also a time of great popular piety um uh, a revival amongst uh the piety of the people should we say and i'm going to read from my manuscript here to 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 maybe encapsulate this these new religious orders, the ones I've just spoken, spoken about, um, so the Sisters of Charity and then the Trappists, these new religious orders taken together with the charism of saints, such as St. Francis de Sales and Vincent de Paul, were a reflection of popular Catholic piety. The church historian Alfred Lappel wrote of, quote, an upsurge in religious life with the practice of Eucharistic adoration devotions to the child Jesus, the Sacred Heart and Mary, and the nuptial mysticism practiced in many convents, convents, end quote. Popular devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and to the Holy Heart of Mary was spearheaded by St. John Eudes, who wrote the devotions for the Mass and the Office for the Feast of the Holy Heart of Mary, which was first celebrated in 1648, and for the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which was first celebrated in 1672. He was also a great evangelizer, preaching more than a hundred missions all over his native France, as well as working for the poor and sick and founding a refuge for fallen women. Devotion to the Sacred Heart was also nourished by the mystical visions received by St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, a nun of the Visitation Order. In these visions, our Lord revealed to her that the great love of his heart for humanity was unrequited and was met with a cold indifference. Inspired by these visions, she promoted the Feast of the Sacred Heart and the First Friday Devotion, which is still widely practiced today. And then, also in the 17th century, we have a great pope. It wasn't a century of great popes, but one great pope does a great deal of good. 
Um, and the 17th century was graced by one really great Pope, Blessed Innocent XI, who made his first business to clean house within the Vatican itself, something which uh, we could do with seeing some more of today. Inheriting a debt of 50 million scudi upon his election in 1676, he greatly reduced papal expenditure, streamlined the curia by abolishing unnecessary honorary posts, and introduced an array of economic measures aimed at keeping the Vatican on a firm financial footing. In so doing, he not only balanced the books, but began to build a financial reserve. Um, there's a, this reminds me of a quip of um, uh, St. John Paul II that he was asked, you know, so how many people work in the Vatican? And he said, about half of them. <laughs> <laughs> so some things never change. In addition, he helped to unite the Holy Roman Emperor and the King of Poland in a military alliance against the invading Turks, <coughs> which would prove successful in lifting the Turkish siege of Vienna in 1683. Following this defeat, the Turks were forced into wholesale retreat from most of Europe. In this sense, like St. Pius V in the previous century, the Battle of Lepanto, etc., Innocent XI could be said to have saved Europe from Islam. It's also noteworthy that Pope Innocent expressed strong disapproval of religious persecution, condemning Louis XIV's treatment of the Huguenots, and strongly promoted Catholic missionary activity around the world. It's to these Catholic missions, especially those in the Americas, that we now turn our attention. Of course, we're now uh, in the period where the New World has, uh, has opened uh, up. Um, St. Peter Claver, a Spanish Jesuit, who spent his life serving the slaves uh, of, uh, of uh, South America and what is now Colombia. Is that South America or Central America? I'm sure I'm showing my complete ignorance of the New World. I'm sorry, I'm an old world person. Um, so in what is now Colombia and for, for over 40 years, uh, he um, served the, uh, the slaves and called himself the slave of the slaves. And uh, also St. Martin de Porres, um, and Rose of Lima, both further south in Peru. So Rose of Lima being the first canonized, uh, first uh, canonized person from the New World. That's down south, of course. Um, uh, but up north, uh, much closer to where we are now, the French Jesuit missionaries in North America, of course, um, uh, we evangelizing the uh, the Native Americans here, with many gruesome martyrdoms which I assume you probably know more than I do. And this was also the century of Katiri Takakwitha, um, who wasn't canonized till 2012, but was you know, known universally as the, the patroness, protectress of, of uh, certainly of, of Canada um, for, 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 um, for uh, I think this goes back to the 18th century. Okay, so that's the good, the saints, the reformers of the, uh, of the 17th century. Let's now move on to the, the bad, Martyrdoms. I never really know where to put martyrdom. You know, good, bad. Obviously, martyrs are going to heaven. All right, so they're good. The martyrs are good, but the politics are, that leads to martyrdom, of course, isn't. So uh, we have already mentioned the the the, uh, the Jesuit martyrs in North America, but that the, in terms of numbers, that pales into insignificance be, beside the hundreds of people martyred in China during this century. Uh, at least two hundred. Um, um, so we talked about the fact that this was a century in which France dominated all that was good, or you know, most of the outside of the New World at least, in, in, old, in old Europe, most of the great saints were from France, but also most of the great heresies from the century were also from France. The two principal ones, Jansenism and Gallicanism, and in, and in modern terminology we might see Jansenism as, 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 as trad, a traditionalist, um, basically that uh, you know, being really hard line uh, in terms of morality but it was heretical in terms of theology because it ba basically uh, was a Calvinized Catholicism um, taking really the ideas uh, similar ideas to Calvin that we are um, uh, completely corrupt f physical matter is corrupt and human uh, the, the human nature is, is basically uh, corrupt so this sort of uh, almost I say Calvinized Catholicism of Jansenism. And then the other extreme, what you might call modernism, 
was Gallicanism, where the church had to be put under uh, the uh, control of the state. And France certainly wasn't the only country doing this, but it was at the forefront where the, the absolutist monarchs um, uh, gaining in power wanted to basically bring the church under the sway of the state. So Gallicanism was about the, the, the French, the French need of the French Catholic Church, not a university Catholic Church where the, where the Pope has virtually no power. So we have these heresies of Jansenism and Gallicanism, both based in France. And also we have René Descartes um, that, that Hegel called the father of modern philosophy. It was also from this century with what really was embryonic radical relativism, making truth uh, ultimately centered in the individual human person, not an objective reality beyond. Crossing the channel into England, the century begins with the, the death of uh, Elizabeth I in 1603, and this great hope that with the death of Bloody Bess would come religious liberty for the Catholics, who by this stage had had uh, with a brief respite during the reign of uh, Mary Tudor, had basically suffered persecution for 70 years. And James the Sixth of Scotland who became James I of England, promised that when he became king, he would um, abolish the, uh, the anti-Catholic laws and, and restore religious liberty. And when he came to power, when he acceded to the throne, he actually, to be fair to him, did an endeavor to put those promises and those principles into practice. However, he met with the opposition of parliament, which was increasingly under the domination of the Puritans, the rising Puritan party, who made it very clear that they were not prepared to tolerate his tolerance. And um, in good Machiavellian fashion, James weighed up, well, who has the most power here? And again, to be fair to him, he's a Scottish king. So you've, already, you've got this, that the xenophobic dimension, right? The English will not take too much to turn against the Scottish king. He needs to placate whoever has the most power. And he says, well, who has the most power? The Puritans, who already have uh, a very large presence in Parliament, or the Catholics, who have been, been impoverished for the last 70 years. He realised the Puritans had more power, and succumbing to their pressure, he brought back all of the anti-Catholic laws. Um, we'll see how this plays itself out, this particular moment in history in the plays of Shakespeare, but we'll do that when we get to the beautiful section of the century. But Charles, uh, James I would pay a price for his um, uh, compromising his principles of Puritanism because his own son, Charles I, would actually be beheaded by the Puritans 40 years later. Um, with the English Civil War between the Puritan party and the Royalists and the Puritans won and, um, and uh, beheaded the king in 1648 and established a short-lived uh, puritanical totalitarianism and I think that's the right word they actually amongst other things they the Puritans banned Christmas for a while um, and England was actually like Narnia a place where it was forever winter and ever Christmas for several years uh, and the roots uh, the, the roots of the well the, the revival of the, the figure of Father Christmas um, came comes from that time because he was a figure in medieval mystery plays Father Christmas or Sir Christmas the sort of personified abstraction of the spirit of Christmas. Well, when Christmas was banned under the Puritans, Father Christmas makes a comeback as this sort of uh, uh, figure of defiance of the Merry England that once was and, and needs to be again. And then we have in 1688 in England, the so-called Glorious Revolution. I talk about Vic the victors writing the history, the Glorious Revolution. Uh, first of all, it is a revolution, and even they admit it, because the, the legitimate king, James II, was deposed. And the reason he was deposed was because he was a Catholic. And by this time, again, the, not just the Puritans, but all those people who, of course, had benefited from the giving away of the, of the church lands, the abbey lands, to the new aristocracy, um, they were not prepared to, to, to tolerate a Catholic monarch on the throne with all that that might possibly entail. So what they did, they paid. Now think about this, you're an Englishman. You know, imagine an American, because the same principle applies everywhere. 
and you pay for an army of foreign mercenaries to invade your own country to depose a legitimate ruler. That's the, the, the grossest and most grotesque act of treachery, which has gone down in history as the Glorious Revolution. Um, I could mention so many English martyrs over this period, uh, but we're in, this, we're in the 17th century, so I'm going to just talk, mention just two um, from this century. One is Anne Lyne, who probably knew uh, Shakespeare. She was martyred in 1601 for the hideous crime of harbouring Catholic priests. Uh, her house uh, her, was raided while mass was being said. The priest escaped by, uh, there's enough notice of the raid that the priest sort of um, took off his vestments and d disappeared amongst the congregation. So he escaped, but she was charged um, with harboring Catholic priests. And she said, were for every one that I harboured, I could have harboured a thousand. That was her defiance and she was uh, hanged. They didn't hang draw and quarter women, they hanged them. Um, so that was 1601 and then uh, almost 80 years later, Blessed Nicholas Postgate. He's one of fa favourite of mine, I always heard of him. Uh, it's one of my favourite favorite parts of England is the Yorkshire Moors. If any of you have read Wuthering Heights, you should have some sort of uh, feel, feel for the Yorkshire Moors. Very bleak part of Northern England. This priest served obviously in secret because the, to be a priest was punished by death throughout the 17th century in England. The, the people of the rural parts of, of, of the Yorkshire Moors until he was betrayed. Uh, and he was in either his late 70s or possibly his early 80s. We don't, we don't know his exact age. When he was um, found guilty of being a priest, he was dragged by hurdle through the city of York and then hanged, drawn and quartered. Think about that brutal death to a man who's 80 or so years old after serving his faithful flock for over 50 years. And uh, my lament is that this person should have a major feast day on the calendar and instead of no one's even heard of him. And he's not even canonized, he's only blessed. He's in heaven though, so what does he care? <laughs> and now on to the beautiful of the 17th century. And it begins in a blaze of literary glory. Uh, obviously we have William Shakespeare, and I didn't mention much about him in the last lecture because I was saving him for this, for this lecture. So Shakespeare's plays are from around 1590 or so to about 1612 or so, so a period of 22 or so years. And he wrote some wonderful plays in the, in, in, the, uh, in the 1590s, which obviously belong to the previous lecture, the previous century, such as Romeo and Juliet and Julius Caesar, the Merchant of Venice, etc. But really his greatest plays uh, were from the first decade of the 17th century. So Hamlet dates from 1600 or 1601. Um, Othello, 1603, um, possibly 1604. Um, 1604 actually, not 600, 1604. And then uh, Macbeth and King Lear, 1605, 1606. Let's look at very briefly what these plays have in common uh, in relation to the history that we're, we're looking at. Hamlet was written around the time of the Essex Uprising, either just before or, or just after. The Essex Uprising was a ri ri Essex Rebellion, uh, a, a, an uprising against uh, the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, led by the Earl of Essex. Uh, one of the uh, Earl of Essex's right-hand right man was the Earl of Southampton, who was Shakespeare's patron. The Earl of Essex was executed when the rebellion failed and the Earl of Southampton was, was uh, confined in the Tower of London uh, and was only released when Queen Elizabeth died. Shakespeare's anger, the, the thing about Hamlet, Hamlet is an, uh, an angry play. You have, you have, you, you're not going to understand Hamlet unless you understand the anger that underlines it. And one of the key things about the Hamlet is, uh, is, is spies, the spy network. Polonius, um, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, even Ophelia, who against her conscience is forced to spy upon Hamlet. And then we have after King James I, um, and by the way, the, 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 uh, the graveyard scene in, in Hamlet is an intertextual dialogue with uh, Robert Suttle's poem Upon the Image of Death. If you read those two, if you read that, that graveyard scene, 
uh, side by side with Robert Sutherland's poem on the image of death, you'll, you'll see it uh, uh, inescapably. So when King James reneges upon his promise, I want you to try to put yourself now into the minds and the hearts of England's Catholics. Those who have stayed loyal to the faith and paid, faith and paid the fines, forced into exile, go to prison, execution. They were just waiting for Queen Elizabeth I to die. When she dies, everything's going to be fine. Um, religious liberty will be restored. King James I comes to the throne. He fulfills his promises. For about a, 10 months, there's religious liberty. Uh, the masses, masses practice freely for the first time um, for decades. And then the persecution comes back in, is enforced again. And now if you're an English Catholic, you have a young king on the throne who could be monarch for another 30, 40, 50 years with no prospect of religious liberty. It's at this point where many Catholics finally capitulate, cannot continue to do this. We held on while the, the queen was on the throne, knowing that she would die, but we can't do this anymore. Many surrendered. The other extreme were the hotheads. They said, well, the only solution now is violence. And that's where that, that's the seeds of the gunpowder plot. Where does Shakespeare fit into all this? Well, his three darkest plays have been at this time. Othello, King Lear and Macbeth. Othello, the source play from Spain that he takes, he changes the name of the Machiavellian villain to Iago, which of course is the Spanish version of James, the new king. Uh, and then he produces, uh, writes a play about a wicked Scottish king. I mean, it speaks for itself. King Lear is about the choice that reticent Catholics have to face. The whole play is set up on, you will give me as your king and father the entirety of your loyalty and of course those who just want uh, creature comfort and power lie they do what the king wants Regan and Gone with his two daughters they don't love him but they say they say that they do and the daughter who really does love him Cordelia refuses she chooses to love and be silent and she's sent into exile as were the Catholics. And at the end of that play, there's this wonderful speech by Lear. I can say much more about it. We don't have time. It's not talking Shakespeare. Um, uh, the come, let's away to prison speech, where in the midst of which he says, and we could be as God's spies. And there's this uh, wonderful poem by St. Robert Southall about um, Mary, Queen of Scots, it's written in her voice in the first person on the eve of her execution. And it's the, 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 the voices, I'm dying for my faith, I'm a martyr. And she, and, and she says that, that I will be as God's spice. Shakespeare, we know, is a great lover of wordplay. And he knew that his audience would know that, that God's spies and God's spice is an intertextual collection, connection that people would get. And of course, the Catholics in general, the Jesuits in particular, are both God's spies because they were illegal, having to be under the radar, but also God's spice that when caught, they were crushed. So that's Shakespeare, works of great beauty born from great darkness. In the same year in which uh, Macbeth and King Lear are being performed for the first time, Miguel de Cervantes, uh, well, the, the publication of Miguel de Cervantes is Don Quixote, which is the probably the best-selling novel of all time. So we have this, um, uh, I say, the 17th century starting, beginning in a blaze of glory, literary glory, with uh, arguably the first novel certainly the first great novel and probably the best-selling novel of all time being written. I used to say, by the way, that, um, uh, that 
Shakespeare and Rigo de Cervantes died on the same day, which would be a great coincidence. Uh, but because the England was so anti-Catholic at the time, they, they did not adopt the uh, Roman calendar. They kept with the Julian calendar, so they were actually 12 days apart. So uh, William Shakespeare died on St. George's Day in 1616, and Miguel de Cervantes also died on St. George's Day uh, 1616, but it was actually, they were actually 12 days apart. Um, but I discovered that after I was telling everybody. They died on the same day for, for eight years, but there you go. You learn, you learn. <laughs> Um, as regards uh, um, uh, that's, that, the, the literature, and there are other great metaphysical poets from the 17th century and some great Spanish playwrights, but uh, they're in the book, they're not, not in the talk because we don't have forever. Music, uh, probably the greatest composer of the century is Monteverdi, and L'Orfeo uh, was described by Susan Tracy, a former colleague of mine at Ivory University, a great musicologist um, who wrote a, a wonderful book I recommend called The Music of Christendom, which is a history basically of music. Um, she called L'Orfeo by Monteverdi the first truly great opera, so the birth of the opera genre, shall we say. In art, uh, there's a great uh, Caravaggio, Rubens, Velasquez, Rembrandt. Um, and probably, we should probably end, however, with, uh, with a sculptor, Gian Lorenzo Benini. And I'm gonna read what I say about him. Um, in the book before we move on to the next century the 18th one final giant needs to be lauded this is Gian Lorenzo Benini, a sculptor who has no peer except for Michelangelo and whose ecstasy of Saint Teresa has no equal other than Michelangelo's Pieta his importance and status was encapsulated by art historian Catholic Eustace quote what Shakespeare is to drama, Bernini may be to sculpture. The first pan-European sculptor whose name is instantaneously identifiable with a particular manner and vision and whose influence was inordinately powerful." End quote. Bernini worked as both an architect and a sculptor on the final stages of the building of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, adding the finishing touches to one of the wonders of the world. So we're going to end with that, the, uh, the building of the new St. Peter's Basilica, the one that's there now. There would seem no better place to end our discussion of the 17th century than in the newly furnished St. Peter's. In a century in which a new world was opening for the spread of the gospel, and in which the old world was ripping itself asunder with war and heresy, we find ourselves in the presence of the Vicar of Christ in the Eternal City. Beyond all that is merely old, and all that is merely new is that which simply is. Christ is. He is the Alpha and the Omega. The church is his, is his mystical body. Like her founder, she sees the old and perceives the new from the perspective of the ever ancient and ever new. So that's the 17th century. We'll move into the 18th. So as in all centuries, there are some great saints. The thing about the 18th century is there's a difference between the saints in the early part of the century and the saints in the, late, the latter part of the century. The saints of the first half of the century died in their beds. Many of the saints of the second half of the century died as martyrs. We'll take the, the, those that died in their beds first. So one of the major saints of the 18th century, the early 18th century, was St. Louis de Montfort, who, of course, we know principally, of course, for his great Marian devotion. Um, his influence obviously continues. St. Paul of the Cross, and, you know, that his devotion was to the passion of Christ, to suffering. This devotion to the passion led to the founding of the Passionists, which St. Paul of the Cross founded. We have St. Alphonsus Liguri, the founder of the Redemptorists, who was a great evangelist known as the Prince of Moral Theologians. And he's probably known today in popular piety because his, um, uh, his prayers are very much part of the Stations of the Cross, the Way of the Cross, our Lenten devotions. 
crossing to the new world, we have Junipero Serra. By the way, I apologise for, for my appalling pronunciation of Spanish. I make no pretense of being able to speak the language. So if it sounds like a, an Englishman not even trying to sound Spanish, that's exactly where we're at. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously it's Juniper, 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 Junipero Serra over here was uh, establishing missions in Mexico before um, establishing missions in what, it, what is now obviously California, all the way from San Diego up to San Francisco. In the East was a different, different scenario, however, because the Catholics in the East were suffering persecution. And I'm going to read what I write about this from my book. Um, the intolerant bigotry of the Puritan ascendancy resulted in widespread persecution of the Catholic minority. The plight of Catholics in Maryland was encapsulated by Father Peter Gilday in his biography of John Carroll, the first Catholic bishop of the United States. Quote, Nothing more noble in American life can be found than the determination of the Catholic parents of Maryland to preserve amongst the children the faith for which their ancestors had fought, suffered and died. Homeschooling parents today, some things never change. The transmission of the doctrines and the discipline of the church was a sacred obligation imposed upon them by their conscience. And at a time when to apostatize from the Catholic faith was the open road to social and political advancement in the English dominions, there was a strength of purpose in the hearts of these Maryland mothers comparable in every respect to the mothers of the martyrs. John Carroll's cousin, Charles Carroll of Carrollton, returned to the United States in 1765 after a period of study in Europe to find himself a second-class citizen in his own country. Quote, It must be realised that, in spite of his wealth, education and culture, in spite of the social standing in which the anti-Catholic laws of Maryland could not rob him, Charles Carroll of Carrollton returned a disenfranchised citizen with no voice in the political affairs of the province. He was denied the public exercise of his religion and was forced by these same laws to pay a double tax for the support of a clergy that could never be his own. End quote. Fighting fearlessly for his civil rights and those of, the fellow, of his fellow Catholics, Charles Carroll became embroiled in 1773 in a public debate known as the Carroll Dulaney controversy, in which he not only won the argument but also the hearts of his fellow Marylanders. Catholic and Protestant alike. Within three years he'd risen to such political prominence that he was among those chosen to be signatories of the Declaration of Independence, the only Catholic to be so honoured. So we'll end, uh, end there with the good. And again, it's a bit mixed, right? Um, you know, martyrdoms. The martyrs are good. Uh, the political circumstances of the martyrdoms are not. The response of the carols is good but the political circumstances that led to their persecution and the necessity of their fighting as they did was not um okay so let's move on we're now moving into the bad from the uh, 18th century first of the war of austrian succession uh, in most wars mo most centuries are beset by wars in europe in the old world at this time and I want to read this, um, uh, continuing basically from where we just left off. Leaving the new world in the midst of the birth pangs which would lead to the founding of the United States, we will return to the old world and to the Holy Roman Empire, which had been at the broken heart of Europe, for better or worse, for almost a thousand years. Following the death in 1740 of the Holy Roman Emperor and King of Austria, Charles VI, his 23-year-old daughter, Maria Theresa, became empress and queen. She inherited a bankrupt treasury and a poorly equipped army, a perilous combination in the politically turbulent times in which she found herself. France, Prussia and Bavaria viewed the death of the emperor and the accession of the young and inexperienced empress as an opportune time to curtail the Holy Roman Empire's power. They were thwarted in these designs by an alliance of nations which came to the Empress's aid. These were Britain, the Dutch Republic and Hanover. Other countries soon became involved, including Spain, Sweden and Russia. With Britain and France at war, the conflict became global. British and French forces fought each other in what is now New York, New England and Nova Scotia and also on the Indian subcontinent. 
whereas British and Spanish forces fought each other in the Caribbean. In this sense, the War of the Austrian Succession has a claim to being the First World War, almost two centuries before the conflict of 1914 to 1918 laid claim to the name. By the war's end, after eight years of military struggle, an estimated 450,000 combatants had been killed. And then that's, if you like, on the military level, the Machiavellian political level of real politic. We also have the rise here of what is now known as the Enlightenment, um, this philosophical questioning of, uh, of, uh, of the philosophy and ethos and theology of Christendom. And again, I'm going to quote. Before we turn our attention to the French Revolution, we will look at the so-called Enlightenment which laid the revolutionary foundations of atheist tyranny. We will begin by offering the Enlightenment's supercilious view of itself, as encapsulated by the authors of the, of the Smithsonian History Year by Year. Quote, During the 18th century, people began to cast aside their old beliefs based on religion and superstition, and started to reason for themselves. Scientists and philosophers across Europe dared to think differently and their new ideas influenced politics, economics and science. This exciting movement became known as the Enlightenment or the Age of Reason." End quote. The Smithsonian spin. This is the, this is the Joseph Pierce response. <laughs> the sheer arrogance and chronological snobbery of this enlightened view of history speaks for itself. Religion and superstition are juxtaposed as synonyms. People had never reasoned for themselves before the 18th century. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Augustine, Aquinas and all other pre-enlightened philosophers could not reason for themselves because they were shackled by religion and superstition. It is only those scientists and philosophers who dare to, spread, to break with the living tradition and the great conversation of intellectual history who were enlightened. The past was anathema. There was no age of reason until the 18th century. The past could, could be dismissed as irrelevant to the new ideas or even as the enemy of these ideas. The Enlightenment had nothing to learn from its elders. It had nothing to learn from the collective experience of humanity over two millennia. Like ignorant and arrogant cads, the children of the Enlightenment had contemptuously kicked down the very ladder by which they climbed. To use a modern terminology, modern language, the Enlightenment was a cancel culture. And we're living with the consequences of that to this day. So now we have uh, the build up to one of the consequences, of course, of the Enlightenment was uh, the, the, the circumstances that would lead to the, uh, the French Revolution, uh, the first uh, violent outpouring of Enlightened thought. In, 1760, in 1761, Voltaire um, talked about when we defeat the Jesuits, um, we will. Um, uh, be able to uh, what's, what's the word he used now without looking it here somewhere um, he used euphemism for the Catholic Church so basically if we get rid of the Jesuits we can then um, uh, curtail the power of the church the Jesuit order at this stage was very powerful in 1770, in 1770 so nine years after Voltaire's words there were 23,000 Jesuits in 273 missions they were, if you like, the, uh, the, the defense of the church militant against this, this Enlightenment uh, philosophy that was on the rise. And it says something about the strength of secularism at this time, uh, the strength of the cancel culture at this time, and the weakness of the church. That it was the Pope, Clement Fourteenth who, kowtowing to pressure from the secular powers, disbanded the Jesuits. Pope's greatest defenders were betrayed by the Pope himself. And of course, this is a mark of the weakness of the church and it was not lost on the secular powers. 
and we had the rise of the absolutist monarchies as secularist tyrannies. Uh, Joseph II, the Holy Roman Emperor, was, was the, uh, the leader of this, but Spain and Germany led the way where basically the, the state was, de was, was uh, took over the running of the seminaries, the state decided how the liturgy was going to be celebrated, the state decided what could and could not be celebrated. Um, uh, St. Jo St. Joseph II, for instance, banned adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. And it's ironic here how God writes straight with crooked lines because there was a French historian who said, God now saved the church by sending the French Revolution to destroy princely absolutism. And that's interesting. But God sends a, basically a proto-communist revolution to save the church from nationalist uh, tyranny. But as to the French Revolution itself, I'm gonna let Harry Crocker, H.W. Crocker from his uh, strident history of Christendom, not always, anyway, I'm gonna make no other comments about it. Uh, but this is very good, and I, I'm going to let him speak for the French Revolution from a militant Catholic perspective. The state had its own church. It began with priests whose vestments included the tricolor of the revolution. It moved on to a cult of reason, and reason's altar replaced Christ at the Cathedral of Notre Dame. The state also endorsed a cult of, cult, cult of nature and, of course, a cult of the state. Heroes of the revolution replaced the saints of the church. In all this, the French Revolution presaged the state religions of Nazism and communism. And indeed, in its mass murders, nationalist uniformity, militarism and lootings in the name of the state and of equality, it embodied the same principles. But the revolution also harkened back to the Reformation. The revolutionaries congratulated themselves as if they were Protestant reformers, wiping out 18 centuries of error by abolishing the Catholic Church. Churches were stripped and religious art desecrated in the Protestant fashion." End quote. And this is my comment upon that. And yet, for all its irrational worship of reason, its enlightened debauchery and its murderous barbarism, the reign of terror also opened the gates of heaven to thousands of heroic martyrs who laid down their lives for their friends in Christ. Thousands of priests who chose death over exile were killed and the holy Carmelite nuns of Compiègne went singing to the guillotine, assured of the heaven haven of the reward that awaits all those who are martyred for Christ. As for the laity, the people of the Vendée region in the west of France rose against the atheism of the revolution, fighting for freedom and the faith under the banner of Dieu le Roi, God the King. After mounting heroic resistance, seldom surpassed in human history, the Vendée rising was put down with ruthless and merciless cruelty, possibly resulting in the deaths of a quarter of a million men, women and children. Ironically, the French Revolution consumed itself in its own blood, the revolutionaries putting each other to death in a diabolical debauch as the reign of terror reached its tragic comic climax. In 1799, the imposition of a military dictatorship under Napoleon put an end to the decaying remnant of the revolution and sowed the seeds of a new Europe-wide war. In the same year, Pope Paul VI died as a prisoner of Napoleon who had brought him to France following the French invasion of Italy. And so it was that a century of philosophical error ended in a reign of terror and the death in prison of a weak and politically powerless Pope. Now, we're not gonna end there because that'd be a negative note to end. Uh, we're gonna end with the beautiful. That's the way this, this the pattern of this book. But I would say something, you know, we, we're, in every generation, we're always tempted to think that we live in the worst of times. Yeah, things have been bad in the past, not as bad as now. This is as bad as it gets. It couldn't possibly be worse. It could, and it has been. In doing my research for this book and writing, writing this book, you know, I think if, you, if I had to name what was the lowest point in the church's history so far in 2000 years, it would be 1800. But the end of the uh, 18th century. French Revolution just happened. Absolutist monarchs before that. The Pope himself, uh, 
abolishing the Jesuit order. <coughs> the Pope in prison, Pope weak, the Church weak, the Enlightenment apparently in, apparently in the ascendancy. So things were bad, but beauty has the last word. Um, and I want to talk about the decline of the visual arts during this century. And it's quite interesting. I want to quote from an atheist art historian. So I find this intriguing. And I'm going to just use what, just, just read what I've written in the book. Just I say it better there than I could otherwise. The 18th century is perhaps the first period when art freed itself from, from convictions, wrote art historian Michael Levy. Quote, continuing the quote, no longer did painting need to state religious beliefs. Uh, record the natural world of explore space. Significantly, painting held little interest for most of the century's great intellectuals, and with new emphasis on it as decoration that often passed unperceived." End quote. <clears throat> These words are particularly interesting because Levy, an atheist who campaigned against religion and superstition as a member of the British Humanist Association, is a child of the Enlightenment and no friend of the Catholic Church. Even so, he is forced to concede that the architects of the Enlightenment had little interest in art, seeing it as being merely decorative, ornamental, and therefore ephemeral and ultimately irrelevant, passing unperceived. He continued with a lament that the 18th century seemed to represent the passing of the true golden age of painting. The beauty had not merely passed, it had apparently passed away. Quote, Men felt there would never again be a Raphael, a Poussin, an Annibale Caracci, end quote. Indeed, Levy continued, belief in art as a power had weakened. The 18th century could hardly fail to be skeptical and scrutinizing of imagination, for it accomplished so much by its rationality and could advance civilization only by destroying myths, end quote. Here we see the philosophy, the philosophical abyss that separates faith and reason from those who seek to divorce faith from reason. For the sons of faith and reason, a myth is a fictional or creatively artistic story which points to deep truths that transcend and supersede the many measurable facts. For the sons of the Enlightenment, of which Levy is a disciple, myth is a lie, something which is untrue because not empirically measurable. It is something which must therefore be destroyed. The former is the very breath and life of the imaginative arts. The latter is the puritanical spirit that assassinates art and kills the beauty of, of which art is an expression and manifestation. I would say that it was a very, the 18th century not a great century for art, but you have Francois Boucher's reclining girl as a masterpiece and yet Things get a little bit poisoned now because it's, although it's beautiful, beautiful paint, painting of a beautiful woman, its subject is erotically suggestive. Uh, you then have uh, um, uh, Joseph Rice experiment with an air pump, which employs chiaroscuro to great effect in the manner of Caravaggio or Rembrandt. The difference is that the masters of the Renaissance had used it to illuminate the truths of scripture or the beauty of the human form, whereas Wright uses it to highlight the enlightenment of the physical sciences. I'm going to finish, well, the one great work of art in, the, in, in British literature, perhaps well, the, the one, the preeminent one at least, there are others, of the, uh, of the 18th century would be Gulliver's Travels, which is a, a very uh, a satirical attack upon the ideas of the enlightenment. Um, don't have too much time to say too much more about that. Uh, read my book, which you whatever you Catholic should know, which might be for sale in there, um, for more on Gulliver's Travels. But for, certainly for music, it was a very special century for music. So it was the century of Vivaldi, Johann Sebastian Bach, Handel, Haydn, Mozart. And I'm going to conclude with the way I conclude this chapter in my book. We will lay the century to rest with Mozart's Requiem, which was unfinished at the time of his death in 1791. According to his widow, Constanza, Mozart believed that he was writing the Requiem for his own funeral. Whether this is so or otherwise, a Requiem is always meant to remind all of us of the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. It is surely appropriate to end 
with Memento Mori, this discussion of the century which, beyond all others, had forgotten the first things and the last things. The century which had been a living death had died. It would not, however, rest in peace. On the contrary, its ghostly and ghoulish presence would haunt the century to come and the one after it, which is a good way of introducing the next two lectures. Thank you so much. God bless. Yes. I agree, I agree with everything that you said about the early Enlightenment and the way they struggled and uh, kicked down the ladder. It was very nice the way you said it, more politely than I. But one thing that um, when I studied the history of this period, uh, I don't see them, they're not so much philosophers in the context of like a Voltaire or a uh, Hobbes, but you take like people like Isaac Newton and uh, the great uh, French chemist, and the, they, they ended up having this from the early 1600s onward. It was like this international communication between mathematicians and um, chemists, and it kind of laid the foundation for the Industrial Revolution and the modern material, you know, the material abundance we have. But I never thought of those people as being quote unquote part of the Enlightenment philosophy. I thought they were just laying the foundation. I was just curious why you had never, in your lecture, mentioned anything about the quote unquote scientific revolution and not enlightenment per se, but. Well, the lecture went on for 50 minutes, which is probably five minutes longer than I wanted anyway. Mm -hmm. So that's the first answer to pure pragmatism. But th th you asked a very, very, very good question. Of course, the, the Catholic Church has always insisted uh, that reason is, 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 is a good. I mean, the, 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 um, uh, to me, the, 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 the manifestation of the Trinity is the good, love, the true, logos, reason, and the beautiful, right, art, creativity. So reason is absolutely from the logos. It, it springs from the logos and leads back to the logos. Um, so the physical sciences are absolutely fine and good. It's <clears throat> when philosophers take those empirical sciences and they form philosophies known as empiricism from it, where the only thing that's true is that which can be empirically demonstrated, which is not what true scientists are, are doing. True scientists are just experimenting uh, and, and coming to conclusions based upon observation. So we do need to distinguish between science and scientism. Well, yeah, we, 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 okay, we make three distinctions and I'll, I'll move on from the question because I wasn't going on for too long. First, we have to distinguish between science and science. Um, that we have to insist that the, 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 the better, bigger definition of science is scientia, which is knowledge, which means that theology is a science, philosophy is a science, history is a science, literature is a science. But anything, anything which leads us through knowledge to the truth is a science in that broader, better understanding of the word. What we now call science, the medievals called natural philosophy, the love of wisdom to be learned from the study of nature. Okay. Uh, and that's a good, absolutely a good, but that's it's just a truncated understanding of, of science if you think that's the only knowledge that's permissible is this particular branch of knowledge, okay? So, uh, so the, first you have to distinguish between science and science. Having done that, we have to distinguish between science and scientism because there's, it's one thing to practice uh, knowledge through the use of reason, right. whether it's theology or, or physics, metaphysics or physics, right? Um, uh, it's another thing to then build a philosophy based upon uh, a misunderstanding of the uh, ramifications that come from empirical knowledge, that basically the only truth that counts is that which can be empirically demonstrated. That's a philosophical question, which is not actually, uh, has, it's a non sequitur as regards conclusions you can draw from I empirical science itself. Thank you. You're welcome. Make the next one easier. <laughs> Any other questions? We'll take another two if they are. Otherwise, we, you can just go and spend some money on books. I mean, I mean, you can't, there's no wine out there. You may as well come and buy a book instead. You yes. mentioned about uh, around 1800, that was, the, in your opinion, the lowest time in the history of the church, right? But there were a lot of good things that happened at that time. I mean, a few years previous about the, the American Revolution and what was accomplished through that. The Pope at the time, Pius VI, he was a good Pope, good person. I mean, he was exiled by uh, 
holy him, but I mean, he was a good holy folk from what I've read. Well, I'm, sorry, I'm not. I'm certainly not trying to demonise the the church in the yeah. in in the in, in the end of the 18th century. But I think the church was weak, and I think it was demonstrably weak. And I think that the, the actions of the Pope in in in, in uh, abandoning the Jesuits, uh, dis, disbanding right. the Jesuits, that, that. and as regards the American Revolution, bearing in mind you're speaking to an Englishman here, so you're on dangerous grounds. Or, <laughs> oh, I am because I'm outnumbered about whatever third of the one here. Um, that, that, that irrespective of what we think of the French Revolution, it's, it has little to do with the history of the church or the history of Christendom per se. Well, we could argue, and this would lead to arguments, but uh, you know, this is the founding of the American nation, for, you know, whatever, whatever we think that means. But it, for me, it's, it's not axiomatic or central to the history of Christendom. That's probably, that's probably a controversial statement that I'm going to. Right, yeah, 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 right, there we go. Well, I'm going back to say the uh, time of the Protestant Reformation and all the crooked popes and everything else. Um, but there were, but there, but there was the response of the church to the to the Protestant Reformation was the what is called the Counter Reformation, right. which is a time of glory for the church. Um, uh, so there was there was a very they very robust militant in the best sense of the word response by the Catholic Church to the Protestant rupture, as opposed to the sort of you know ending with a whimper at the end of the 18th century. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, Father, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you. I mean, I, it's just a subjective opinion. That if, you know, if, if, if I look at the 1800 compared, for instance, 2000, you know, 1800 for me would be a much worse time. If you, would, if you could not see the future and didn't, you know, or, or understand the, the landscape of the past, the, the things would seem much dire, much more dire for the Catholic Church uh, in 1800 than they, than they would in 2000. That was, that was, my, that was my point, really. Um, Okay, one last question at all? Going back to Shakespeare. <laughs> yeah. when he, people have said that he was a classic Catholic. You know, that underneath it all he was a Catholic. Any observations about that? Well, in my book, The Quest for Shakespeare, I say he wasn't a classic Catholic, uh, nor was he a secret Catholic. He was a safe Catholic. In other words, that in Elizabeth I's court, um, many of her ladies-in-waiting and her courtiers of various descriptions, including the, including the Earl of Southampton, were known Catholics. And Elizabeth I actually preferred Catholics to Puritans, it came down to it, but, but uh, she, as, long as, the, as long as the Catholics were not seen to be uh, politically subversive or a threat to her royal person uh, or to the state, um, she was quite happy to turn a blind eye. I'll give you an example, and I think this, this, this epitomizes Shakespeare's position. The, William Byrd, the composer, he and his wife were recusant Catholics. They refused to go to Anglican services. They paid fines. Um, so he composed simultaneously music for the Queen's court and masses for the, the Catholics of England. Um, Elizabeth I knew this uh, and she liked him. And she actually told her attorney general to leave him alone. And even though she knew he was a Catholic, gave him a monopoly on the publication of, 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 of music. So um, uh, I see Shakespeare as being in that position, that he, it's not that his Catholicism was not known, it was known, but he was not seen to be a threat to the state. I mean, she said, Elizabeth first said, um, you know, the, the Earl of Essex, uh, his followers, uh, staged a, a performance of Richard II the day before the, uh, the eve of the Essex Rebellion in the hope it would help to ferment the people foment the people against Elizabeth. And Elizabeth uh, said, do you not know that I am Richard II? So she understood. But nonetheless, I mean, the, the, she, she was quite happy to tolerate people she didn't actually feel were threatening her. So that's, it was very complicated. The church had to actually, the, church had to, the Catholic Church had to give rules for those who were in Elizabeth's court as to what they could and could not do. So for instance, they could follow the court in the Queen's train to Anglican services because to refuse would be an act of treason, right, and a death sentence, but they were not allowed to take communion. So that, you know, there were so many Catholics in the highest echelons of society in, in, during the, the reign of Queen Elizabeth. It's a very complex and complicated scenario, the more you study it. Thank you, everybody. God bless.